yeah, so just looking at these real quick. We're covering the uh, quiz that was shared, or just some of the problems at least. And uh, the very first one, it says the forces. Do you know if everybody has the same numbers or different numbers? We all have the same numbers. Okay, yeah. So, well, I guess this is a practice quiz, not a, not a real quiz. But this right. is uh, accelerating because there's some force, and there's also some other force, I guess of the same magnitude, that's kind of at an angle. So the idea behind this one is, this force is, you know, going directly in. This force has two components to it, one lifting it up and one lifting it... Uh, excuse me, one lifting it up and the other one lifting it to the, the side. But uh, the basic idea here is, what is the magnitude A of the acceleration for the blocks shown? So we always start with these problems with just the sum of the force in the horizontal direction. This problem doesn't really care about vertical. Um, because we're not told that the block like lifts off or anything. Uh, but the sum of the force in the horizontal direction is equal to ma, and this is what we want to find. So at this point, we just need to figure out what the sum of the forces is. Um, so sum of the forces. And uh, I write this out because it's different from, you know, it's not necessarily the same thing as this f or this f. But the idea is this f can be broken down into a theta component, f cosine theta, and f sine theta. And the two horizontal components are just these two right here. Like, can you picture them? They're like literally both the horizontal ones, yeah? Yeah. So those are exactly what you want to uh, write as your sum, f cos theta. And just in one fell swoop, I'm just going to multiply or divide through by the m. So this is ultimately your value for a. And uh, that's just going to be whatever that is. It looks to me like... Do you need to have both uh, f's in there for it to work, or would it just work with one? Because it's going to be the same acceleration throughout the whole thing, right? Same acceleration. Uh, sorry, what do you mean? So like, uh, if I didn't have the f plus... The, if I didn't have the f cosine part in there, and I just mm -hmm. left f over m, wouldn't the acceleration be the same for each uh, magnitude? Well, free. like if you're asking about a different problem where this force just didn't exist at all, is that what you're asking? Then this would just be the force. This then this would all that's be this would all be all that's left. Oh, but because they gave it to us, then we need to find it. Yeah, exactly. It's just uh, you know, if there's one person pushing over here, uh, this would be their contribution. But if there's a second person pulling with a rope kind of upwards, then they also add in a contribution. That's what that's oh, saying. Okay, so it's like a separate pulling. Per okay, yeah, I exactly. thought it was just. It was. I thought it was just uh, portraying the Newton law thing, where it's like, oh, but it's not an opposite force. Okay, never mind. Right. No. Uh. Yeah. This one has nothing to do with opposite forces. It's just sort of two, uh, two separate forces, and they each sort of have a contribution. Right. right. The sum of the force. It turns out, uh, as it turns out, the sum of the uh, accelerations, or how should I put it, their contributions are perfectly proportional to the, their horizontal, uh, force. Got it. And even though. Even though their magnitudes are the same, uh, this one is sort of less effective because it's going at an angle, if that makes sense. Okay, so that's where I messed up, is I thought it was just all one and the same. Gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so the next one is talking about the archer fish. <laughs> Very funny. Uh, some people were actually asking about uh, this one earlier. I just didn't, didn't uh, do it all the way through for them. But the archer fish is saying, okay, it's at whatever angle, theta from horizontal, aiming at some, like, bug. Uh, I guess this is a bug. Uh, at insect, and it says it's at some height is equal to 2 meters. And it's asking, how fast must the fish spit the water? So that's basically going to be a V-naught. So you can basically just imagine, like, a single droplet of water without having to imagine, like, a full stream. But it's basically going to be shooting out, you know, presumably shoot, treat the water like a projectile. So I think the aim here is... Uh, you know, aiming it so that it barely just hits the uh, thing, so that it's at the highest peak of its uh, trajectory. We, from this information, we need to figure out what uh, what v naught is. So, okay, that's one of the kinematics, right? That's yeah, gonna this happen. is going to be some combination of kinematics. I think this is not force. Uh, but let's think real quick. The fact that it's at the the fact that it's at the very cusp of the height tells us that, you know, velocity vertical is equal to zero at this point. And uh, what exactly is the easiest way for us to do this? Um, 
So, you know, when I don't have a solution immediately come to mind, I just start writing out the kinematic equations. But uh, so this is going to be y is equal to v naught sine theta t uh, minus one half g t squared. Hmm. Almost feels like this problem ought to be able to be done without thinking about time. So I'm also going to think about writing the other kinematic. Well, hold on. I'll write the I'll write the horizontal one too, but this is v naught cos theta t. And then writing vf squared. So in the vertical, uh, for vertical components, vf squared minus v naught sine theta squared is equal to 2 uh, minus 2g times h. Hmm, this equation seems kind of promising because this is going to be zero, right? So we know g, we know h, and we know sine theta. So yeah, we can solve for v naught this way. Not too bad, right? Right. And uh, I think that's all there is to it. You don't have to think about time at all. Very nice, where, huh? Where does that, uh, that sine theta come from? Yeah, of course. So basically, v naught can be broken down into... So if this is the direction of v naught, right? There is a uh, v naught cos theta. And then the v naught sine theta. Exactly, v naught sine theta. Exactly. Okay. That's where that comes from. So this is just uh, you know, that kinematic equation in the vertical direction. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Do, do, do. During each heartbeat, about 80 grams of blood is pumped. Oh, by the way, uh, if uh, I, I, we were saying earlier, but if you wanted to invite anyone, you can feel free to. Uh, yeah, I messaged three people. I don't know. Yeah, if sure. Gonna... No worries. Yeah, no. Uh, you know, the goal is to. Uh, sorry, is this a practice quiz for something that's coming tomorrow? Yeah. <laughs> okay. What time? uh five or six p.m okay well heck i'll put this up and see if anyone wants to uh use it but during each heartbeat about 80 grams of blood is pumped into the aorta in approximately 0.2 seconds interesting the blood is accelerated from rest in about from rest to about one meters a second what is the average force okay all right so here maybe i will use numbers 80 grams just to keep this right in approximately 0 0.2 seconds. Blood is accelerated. So basically, we want to find acceleration. This is, we're basically going to find this in reverse, right? So at the very end, we want to get, um, we want to get force, right? But to get to force, we need to know uh, acceleration, because once we know, once we have acceleration, we can use mass to get the force, right? Right. So this is basically the new stuff. This is the new stuff that you learned on forces. But everything up to this point is kinematics. So that's just how the problem is going to break down. Right? So up to this point, or I would say up to up to this point, we don't even have to worry about forces. We just need to worry about kinematics. And how is this going to work? It says it's accelerated from rest to about one meters per second. Um over the course of t is equal to 0 0.2 seconds, right? So this is basically saying if the velocity final is equal to velocity initial plus a times the change in time, I guess I'll just call it t. Uh, velocity not, they said, was at rest, so it's zero. Acceleration is what we're trying to find. Velocity final is one meters a second, and time is 0 0.2. So it looks to me like we can just multiply that on through and get... Uh, it looks like 5 is equal to the acceleration. And from there, we can just set... Uh, excuse me. Uh, once we know the acceleration, we can just do F is equal to MA and solve for what F. Mean what we know. Oh. Right? No, this uh, problem is nice in that it gets perfectly broken down into old and new. But uh, yeah, that's the idea of what you got to do. Physics is so much more fun when you know what you're doing. <laughs> when you know what you're doing? <laughs> Yeah, I sometimes it's got to, you know, you got to, sorry, roll around in the confusion a little bit, but other times it's not so bad. Oh, like those cannon problems? The cannon problems? Those were, those ones were cute. So it shows an acceleration versus force graph for three objects pulled by wires. Very interesting. If the mass of object two is something, what is the mass of object one? Okay, so we're probably going to be making use of the fact that uh, it's, there's a linear relationship between force and acceleration. 
right? And each one of those things is uh, is perfectly linear. So what this graph is basically saying is one, two, and three, one, two, and three. So this is force and this is acceleration. So it seems like object three isn't even relevant, but it says that object two, so M2, I'm gonna call it is equal to 36 kilograms. And it's asking what is the mass of object one? And to do that, we basically just need to find some points on a, to do this, we basically need to find some vertical line. So basically what we're saying is we're fixing the force and we're looking at the ratio between acceleration, right? And it looks to me like when force is equal to two, we got some good candidates that are easy to read because this is like two uh, in units of, I think they're calling it A, A1 or something. And this is five A1, right? So what this is basically saying is for object two, this is saying that force is equal, force is equal to uh, M2 times acceleration. And what is that? The force is basically two is equal to, uh, what is it like 36 kilograms? Yeah. Times A. Right. Oh, and then we just solve. Sorry. Three. What is A? So, sorry. We, we're, we, we're not solving for A. We're given A. I think A is just two A1 or something like that. Uh, sorry. Force is relative units. Um, Sorry, maybe I should reword it this way. Let's just leave force as just this like thing, because um, we're not too interested in its actual value. We just care that uh, it happens that the exact same force is equal to m1 times. Sorry, what I'm trying to say acceleration of mass two and acceleration of mass one. Like basically, the ratio of the masses is the same thing as the ratio of accelerations, but in reverse, because force is fixed. I'm lost. Okay, I should explain this in a better way. Um, what I'm saying is, it so happens that for for this particular vertical line, right, this is at some fixed force. I don't even care that the value is two, I just care that the value is fixed, right? Right. So let's put it this way. I'm gonna say this force, um, maybe G for force given. So force given is equal to I'm going to look over here. This is 2A1 times uh, the mass of object 2, which is M2. And on the other side, it's also equal to 5A1 times the mass of object 1. Right? So now that we have this chain of equalities, I don't even care about the middle anymore. I just care about comparing these two, which is to say 5A1 times M1 is equal to 2A1 times M2. Uh, the A1s cancel out. We're not interested in those. We just want to know the ratio of the masses, right? right? So at this point, 5 halves is equal to M2 over M1. That's what that's saying. Oh. It's basically saying if force is constant, then MA and MA are constant. So if because we each knew, knew the two accelerations and we knew one of the masses, then we can find the other mass. That's what this is saying. Got gotcha. you. Yeah, okay. Thanks for telling me know that, uh, you know, it's really helpful to know when I'm, you know, sort of gotten off rails to restart an explanation. I think that's good. Uh, but yeah, at this point, we knew what, uh, whatever, we knew whatever M2 was, right? And we're right. looking for M1. Okay, so then just isolate M1 and move that over. Not too crazy, right? Nope. All good. All good. Sounds good. All right. I'm going to do a speed run. Uh, so now I think we're on number five, which is sort of, Ah, now we're talking about strings, right? Uh, we're talking about these strange like contraptions of ropes that form triangles. But it's saying, okay, this is string one and this is string two. So one of these has a tension of 34 newtons and the other one has a tension of 24 newtons. And the thing about strings is that it's understood that tension is just sort of pulling um, you know, in every direction at a consistent tension. Um, how should I put this? It's basically saying, you know, over here it's pulling at 24 and over here it's pulling at 34. So what is the mass of the object shown? Okay. 
and you notice that they only give us one of these angles and it say it's 40 degrees and they just expect us to figure out everything else out right right so what we can say about the situation is that it's static which means that there's no acceleration in the x direction or the y direction so somehow everything's just got to cancel out so let's talk about the x direction in the x direction um there's only two forces right there's in the x direction there's uh force one i'll write it down here force one uh and i think that's going to be a sine of 40. Mm. the other one is cosine 40. yeah that's going to be in the y direction that's going to be um let me do this a piece at a time okay uh maybe i should define my positive x and y axis i'm going to say this is the positive direction for the x axis and this okay. is the positive direction for the y axis okay. okay i just like making things neat but if this is the case, then this is theta 2, which we don't exactly know yet. But uh, what this is going to say is 24 times sine of theta 2 minus 34 times sine of 40 is equal to 0. And you notice that it's sine in this time because uh, just how the angles are sort of described, right? Because uh, this then becomes the horizontal force. So it's sort of opposite. You see that? Hold on. You see why it's sine rather than cosine? Oh, because it's relating? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's just this time around, uh, you're usually used to cosine being the horizontal one, but just because of how it's drawn, uh, theta's, you know, the opposite uh, leg from theta is uh, the horizontal. So that justifies why it's sine. And then as for the y direction, it's pretty similar but this time, both of them have an upwards contribution, which is going to be uh, 24 cosine theta 2 plus 34 cosine of 40. And the negative is going to be mass times gravity. And that's equal to zero. So what's going to happen here is this equation, the only unknown is theta 2. So we're going to solve for theta 2. And then at that point, the only unknown left is m, because we know what theta 2 is, right? So at that point, you can just solve for m. Ooh. Pretty clean, right? Pretty clean, I hope. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah no, that's exactly how these problems go. Thing. It seems so complicated for a second, because it's like, wait a minute, you didn't even give me the information on the angle about the second rope. It turns out all that information was just encoded because it's static. And you know the magnitudes of the, f sorry, you know the magnitudes of the tension, and you know one of the angles. And it turns out that's enough to, uh, that's enough to figure things out because you can break the x and the y component separately. Yeah, I would have mixed them up. Yeah, the fact that we can separate the x and the y components out, um, kind of makes this problem solvable, because it's basically saying for the x component, the mg doesn't even matter at all, right? The mg is going downwards; it's not contributing net to the left or to the right. Yeah, that's easy how that goes. Easy peasy, right? Yeah, not so bad. Okay, on to the next one. I'm gonna see how fast we can get these done. I okay. Uh so the next one is saying, oops, let me just go back a bit. Okay, the next one is saying there's sort of two bodies colliding in figure one. Yeah, they're kind of going in like this. And the other one is sort of they're going in at an angle. We're kind of playing billiards, right? And we're trying to yeah. do a slice or something. And uh, this one's, you know, not quite a trick question, but it's just totally conceptual. And it's saying your options are, A, they exert equal and opposite forces on each other in both one and two, or they exert equal and opposite forces in just one or just two or in neither. What do you think? The forces, what are the other choices? Forces are equal and opposite to each other in one, but only the component of the force is parallel to the velocities in two. The forces are equal and opposite in one, but only the component of the forces perpendicular to the velocities are equal in two. What do you think? What do okay, you think? Well, I know that law says that everything has to have an equal and opposite reaction, so I'm going to say both. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They exert equal and opposite forces in both one and two. They're just trying to, uh, they're just trying to trip you up a little bit. But uh, you know, our friend Newton and his uh, what is this one? The, his first law or his third law? Yeah. 
I forget. No, it's his third law. Uh, and, you know, his third law says that equal and opposite no matter what, right? It doesn't care that they're at a... He doesn't care that they're glancing at each other. They're still going to provide uh, forces equal and opposite. And uh, that's going to apply to both perpendicular, parallel components, whatever. Straight shot. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of both parallel and perpendicular, right? Because you can kind of think about splitting each force into triangles. And the... See, the uh, vertical components are opposite to each other. And the horizontal components also opposite to each other. You know, <laughs> no matter which way, you know, it, no matter which way the dice tumbles, Newton always comes out on top. He's, uh, he's never wrong. Well, okay, so what? what's up? No. So if the only force is acting on some 10 kilogram mass, okie dokie. Uh, sorry, just a second. If the only force is acting on a 10 kil... Okay, what the heck is going on on the screen right now? Uh, sorry. Just a second. So, only forces acting on a 10 kg mass are F1 is equal to 3i plus 5j. F2 is equal to 5i and 5j. What is the magnitude of the acceleration of the particle? Okay. Whoa. What's up? I don't know where to start. <laughs> don't know where to start? We can always just write, um, draw the particle as maybe a point mass and just figure out where, how the heck to break this thing down, right? So what this is saying is, okay, let's first draw force one. That's saying three to the right and five up. Just going to try to draw it relatively, okay? So this is a three five, uh, sorry, a three five triangle. All right. And the other one is saying five and five. So that's sort of like, so that's sort of like this. Now, the idea here is we could do a bunch of nasty trig to figure out what the total displacement is, or we could remember that uh, vector, uh, sorry, vectors in the x and y direction can add up independently. And we can just remember that this corresponds to a total vector of a displacement of eight, and a, a total vertical displacement, uh, sorry, I gotta erase these, of 10. So this is the net displacement, right? Because you just added 3, 5 to get 8, 5, 5 to get 10. Oh. So the total force is just this, uh, I guess, this 8 and 10 vector. And if we want the magnitude of this thing, it's not so hard. We just use a distance formula, right? Or uh, the magnitude formula. So that's 10 squared plus 8 squared. I think that's the square root of 164. Yep. And uh, yeah, at this point, we just come down here and we say, well, I guess the total magnitude uh, of the force is equal to ma, because we're just asked about magnitudes right now. And uh, yeah, at that point, you just take f and divide that by m, both of which quantities you know. Not so bad, right? Acceleration is always positive, or just in this case, it's always positive? Uh, we're asked about the magnitude of the acceleration, so it's understood that we're being asked for a positive number. Okay. You know, maybe the people define the, uh, maybe people define uh, this direction to be negative, but just because the problem is asking about magnitude, you don't care about the orientation of the axes at all. Okay. Alrighty, the next one, actually, someone else already asked me today. So they were talking about the sort of circular motion. And I guess what's happening is that you got a plane pilot who's sort of doing a dive bomb, right? They're sort of uh, coming in in a dive bomb in a circular motion. And at the very uh, bottom of their descents, uh, it's asking us about what, the, what acceleration they have, right? So acceleration can always be broken down into centripetal and tangential accelerations. So... Uh, and this radius is, I think, given to us as 800. So we always remember that one of the most fundamental equations in a circular motion is uh, centripetal acceleration is equal to v squared over r. And because they gave us that, uh, at least the magnitude of v is equal to 200, well, that gives us centripetal acceleration. That's just... Um, so, so, sorry, this is... Eh. So we know v squared and we know r, so now we know 
centripetal acceleration, right? I think this just turns out to be 200 squared over 800, which, if I remember correctly, turns out to be just equal to 50. And then there's, okay, so that's one of the accelerations. And uh, just as it so happens, because he's at the very bottom here, it turns out that AC corresponds to the positive y direction, and AT corresponds to the positive x direction. They just happen to ask at a very convenient spot. You see that? Wait, say that one more time? Yeah, so like if they had asked us about the problem some, at some other point, um, tangential acceleration is going to be kind of at a nasty angle, and so is uh, tangential, uh, tangential acceleration and it's centripetal like acceleration are both going to be problem, skewed, right? right? What's up? Yeah, like that last string problem? Yeah, exactly like that last problem. You know, the angles are whack. But because they happen to ask us just at the bottom, it's extremely convenient for us because this happens to be in the positive x direction and this happens to be in the positive y direction. Yeah? So basically yeah. what I'm saying is once we figure out the magnitudes of AC and AT, we're pretty much done because we can just slap an I hat and J hat on them and call it a day. Sweet. Yeah. So then, okay, how, we figured out what AC is. So what's AT? And the way to do this is because they tell us that the uh, pilot's speed at that instant is increasing by 20 meters per second squared. So one of the things conceptually is that centripetal acceleration when acting on a vector, when, sorry, centripetal acceleration when acting on something traveling in a circle doesn't change the magnitude of the velocity, right? So AC changes the, quote, direction. of uh, the velocity v, but not the magnitude. Only the tangential velocity changes the magnitude. And when you put it like that, well, we're pretty much done because they're telling us that uh, the acceleration, you know, the actual magnitude of the acceleration change is 20 meters per second squared. Sorry, my screen froze up for a second. Ugh. 20, 20 meters per second squared. And what this is saying is we can basically ascribe all of that to tangential acceleration. So at this point, we know our centripetal and tangential velocities, and we can just say the total velocity vector is equal to uh, 50i plus 20j. I'll get rid of the bracket. We're just plugging that right in there. And this right here, because again, it just happens at this point at the bottom, it lines up perfectly with x and y. You see that? Yeah, so we, they, they basically gave us that last part, right? Yeah, exactly. This question was really uh, almost completely conceptual, other than this one calculation. It was just, uh, we had to sort of know that AC changes the direction of the velocity without changing its magnitude. And honestly, that kind of blew my mind when I was a student learning this for the first time, right? Because your point sort of has a velocity going like this, and now something's pushing kind of perpendicular against it, right? You can almost imagine like a little angel with wings pushing against its direction of motion. And when I was in high school, I was like, man, this is so painful for me to think about. How is that not changing its speed somehow, right? But if at every like single point along its path, it's perpetually being pushed inwards, that's where the circle motion comes from. That's where the circle motion comes from. Oh. You see that? It's like no yeah. matter, like imagine you're just trying to have a nice walk about your day and a, uh, you know, your obnoxious little brother keeps pushing you towards your, uh, towards your left side. And if you keep going, you know, if you perpetually keep going left, you're sort of eventually going in a circle, right? Like, at this very moment, your velocity is perfectly perpendicular, sorry, parallel to the ground, but you're being pushed next to it. Sorry, you're being pushed sort of towards the circle center, which is where that curvature comes from. Yeah, sorry, that was a bit of a mouthful. But I think conceptually, it takes a bit of just playing around with that in your head to get over it the very first time you think about it. Uh, I think that pushing thing kind of makes sense. Okay, so I ride a motorcycle, right? So when I keep that same lean, mm -hmm. that's why I always go in a circle. So Because it's, it's always that constant state of gravity. Right, right. Um, you know, in that case, yeah, I guess it would be gravity, huh? Gravity kind of, as you lean over, gravity sort of is sort of that little angel pushing you a little bit towards the center of whatever circle you're in, riding in. And, uh, yeah, like, the first time you think about circular motion in a physics class, I 
I think it tends to break your mind for a little bit, but hopefully not for too long. Trip out. I didn't know that. Yeah. Makes me think, yeah. But like, even though you're going in a circle, you can speed up, right? Like if you just hit the gas really, really hard. And that's sort of what this tangential acceleration is saying and what this total acceleration increase is saying. Like even though you're traveling in a circle, you can increase your speed, but all of that gets ascribed to the tangential acceleration, which can change your, um, which can change the magnitude. But it's still going to be a circle, just a wider circle then, right? Uh, I don't think so. Um, hold on. I mean, you can just like imagine you're being confined to the track or imagine that like there's some rope at the center here that's keeping you at a fixed distance, right? So right. I think, it, you know, some tangential acceleration okay. would mean that you're... You're just going to finish faster. Exactly. If, you're, if your uh, radius is fixed because you're like attached to a string or something, um, yeah, it just means you're going to be faster. But if you're not constrained to a track, yeah, I think if, Excel, you know, AT gets too large all of a sudden, then you're going to be flying off the rails. That's sort yeah. of what happens if you're like a race car taking a really, really tight turn, but you're going too fast and still accelerating too much. Then you sort of wipe out. Can you picture that? Like if you're trying to go yeah. a race car, trying to go about a turn, but you know, your car is going too fast and speeding, like you're not going to stay on the track. You're going to kind of fly off. Right. And that's sort of their acceleration tangential acceleration kind of overwhelming them um or maybe it's because they lose traction right because it's the friction of the rubber meeting the dirt that gives them that centripetal acceleration that kind of keeps them in the path of the circle but if that starts slipping then they fall away and uh you know fireworks happen <laughs> yeah Sweet. yeah and then okay we're getting to the end here but oh okay we're talking about a bunch of forces so we have four situations shown to the right with four identical boxes, each with the same mass. In each case, there is a 10 Newton force applied. The box remains at rest. Okay, so the box is at rest. So rank the magnitude of the normal force. So we're talking about the normal force exerted by the surface on the box from the least to the greatest. Gotcha. Okay. So this is the surface, this is the surface, this is the surface, and uh, this is the surface. Okay, so does gravity exist in this niche situation? Uh, does it say it does, does it? Um, yeah, it does not say, which makes this question just a little bit awkward for me, whether or not we're supposed to assume that it exists. Let's just not assume it exists. In each case, there is a... Box remains at rest. Rank the magnitude of the normal force exerted by the Okay, so if it's exerted by the surface in the box, I think we're going to have to assume that uh, gravity does exist. Okay, because in this case, if gravity did not exist, then this box would just be flying off because of the force, right? But the fact that we're told that the box remains at rest... For which box? Uh, for this one right here. If there was no gravity, right? If oh, there was right, no gravity, right, right. then pulling it this way would just make it fly off. So I think we're supposed to assume that gravity exists. Okay. So for this one right here, the normal force is basically just, you know, it, whatever is pushing down, the normal force is whatever pushes back against it. So I think if I remember correctly, you can sort of think about the normal amount of the normal force as like if you were literally just had a bathroom scale underneath there, the normal force is whatever the bathroom scale would read. So like, um, you know, if you're standing on a bathroom scale, you know, and let's say you weigh 200 pounds, right? That's your normal situation, just standing on it. If someone pulls on you to your right, that doesn't really change it. Yeah, because the that is totally orthogonal to the uh to the horizontal sorry, horizontal force is totally orthogonal to the vertical plane of the normal force. So this is sort of the neutral. Right? This is the normal force act. In this situation, it's almost as if this force doesn't exist because we're just talking about the magnitude of the normal force. Make sense? Wait, no. Wait, I why, talk too why much? does the right side not yeah. matter? Um, it's because of... Okay, let me just uh, word it in a different way. So the normal force, it's kind of like velocity, right? Where in velocity, the horizontal and vertical components are kind of independent of each other. Right. The same goes for forces. Uh, in this situation, 
even if there's a force going horizontal, uh, the normal force doesn't care about horizontal at all. The normal force only cares about um, what's being applied downwards. You know, the weight being applied downwards, which the normal force will exert in equal and opposite direction. So, like, if you put a bunch of weights on this one, then the weight increases and the normal force increases. But if you pull something in to the right, perfectly to the right, the normal force doesn't care or react to that at all. Okay, so that's what it's trying to say right now. Yeah, it's just totally orthogonal. Got it? Got it. So for this one right here, this one is now a little bit different because there's a horizontal and a vertical component. So the normal force doesn't care about this one, sure, but now it's sort of lifting it away. So remember the scale analogy I was talking about? The fact I that there's a you know, force sort of pulling you up a little bit, not enough to lift you off, but enough to like lessen the weight means that the normal force isn't as big as it used to be because the force pushing down isn't as big as it used to be. So just kind of remind yourself, the normal force is what like a scale would read in that situation. Got it. Yeah. So uh, this one would, the normal force in this situation would be a little bit less than neutral because uh, some of the weight is being, uh, you know, let's say that there's a, uh, you know, you are just broke your leg or something and your friend is helping support you by pulling you up a little bit. So you don't have as much weight coming down on the scale. Okay. So this next situation is basically saying, this time the normal force is sort of pointing, uh, it's sort of, this is a ceiling now instead of a floor, right? Right. This is a ceiling. So the force of gravity is sort of working downwards and the force, um, the force that we're applying uh, is going upwards. So, do we actually know what the weight of this thing is? Yeah, we do have the weight of this object. So at this point, we actually need to think about numbers a little bit. But mg, if the weight is just, if m is just equal to 1, then mg is just equal to about 10. Well, I guess 9.8, right? 9.8. And the force being applied here is 10. So this force just barely wins out. You see that? Right. This force That's just barely wins out. What's up? That's why it sticks to the ceiling. Yeah, exactly. If it was less than 10, it would be falling. Sorry. If this value was uh, less than 9.8, it would be falling. But okay. What this is saying is that the net force between these two is only 0 0.2, which means that the force normal pushing back to you Right, like at this point on the scale, you would only read like 0.2 pounds, I think, or 0 0.2, 0 0.2 newtons rather. But this is saying that the normal force pushing back is also very light because it, uh, it, you know, it's just, <laughs> what do you put it? This force just barely wins out, so it's not pushing against the ceiling very hard. So the ceiling isn't pushing against you very hard either. If you squeezed a scale here and like stuck it to the ceiling with tape, you know, the scale would just barely register. Make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So over here, now we're kind of doing this thing at a bit of an angle, right? So what happens here is now mass gravity is going downwards and it's perpendicular to the, uh, to the surface. So mass gravity doesn't really matter in this problem. All that matters is this component of the force, which is at some angle theta, right? So let's call this 10 cosine theta, which we know is less than 10. Well, yeah, okay. So then that basically pushes in and the normal force pushes back. So the normal force here is just some value that's a bit less than 10, but, uh, you know, not too much less than 10, right? Because cosine is, the angle is pretty large. I can't see what it says, but it seems to be a pretty big angle, like 60 degrees or something. Yeah, 60. Yeah. So uh, at this point, Okay, so maybe we just do it exactly. So in this one, n is equal to 10 cosine theta. In this one, n was just equal to like 0.2. And over here, n was just equal to, I think it was... Zero, uh, right? Well, no, it was mg, right? mg. Right, because the normal force came entirely from mass and gravity. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. Right, and over here, the normal force was equal to, I think, mg minus... Uh, what is that 45 i think yeah. we had to mg minus 10 cosine 45 and i guess over here i'll write it as cosine of 60 
So basically, we just got to plug in these numbers to just compare them. But just visually, it looks like this one is the smallest. This one is the largest, probably, because this one's almost 10. And uh, these two, we would probably just have to calculate them to figure them out. But the cosine of 60 is like a half, right? Mm -hmm. So this is probably like 5. And this one over here looks to be a little bit less than 5. So I'm thinking the order is probably this one, this one, this one, and this one, but use a calculator to, double, to double check. Make sense? Yes. Yeah. Already. And I think for our last one is two buildings are each of height H. Okay. Measured from the ground and are located at a distance L apart. A ball is shot horizontally with a velocity v from building A such that it hits just the bottom of building B before hitting the ground. So I guess it just sort of is like that. If building B is moved to half the distance and the ball is launched with the same horizontal velocity, where on building B does it hit the side? Oh, interesting. Very interesting. Ugh. Yeah, so the big question here is, is there enough information? And off the top of my head, I don't know. I think I need to think about it for a quick minute. But, uh... Off the top of your head, if the distance gets halved, do you think the point of contact would be in the top half or the bottom half? Top. Yeah, I would think top, just because of the shape of the parabola, right? Because if it was a straight line, it would be perfectly at half. But I would expect, because of the concavity, for the parabola to sort of be above it the entire time until they reach down there. Interesting little, interesting little experiment. Um, but as for whether or not we can get the exact information... Um, Wait, wait, wait. Draw the parabola again? Draw the parabola again? Yeah. I think it's got to look like that, right? Uh, ball is shot horizontally with a line. Yeah, I think so, too. Yeah. So, let me think if we actually have enough information here or not. I'm kind of leaning towards no, but we got to make a good try first, right? So launch with the same horizontal velocity. So basically, what do we know about the original situation, given that it's launched with V-naught? We know that there's no initial... Uh, we know that there's no... So horizontal, we basically know that uh, L is equal to V-naught times time. And vertical, we know that minus H is equal to, uh, there's no initial velocity in the horizontal direction, so I think it's just one-half g t squared. So this is in the original, and in the half, uh, we know that, well, because length is halved, uh, the time is also halved. So, so the time is one half of what it was before. And now we're trying to find delta y is equal to minus one half g. And now it's going to be one half t squared. Uh, the squared is going to be on the outside. So yeah, it looks like we can, in fact, solve this. This looks to me like one half g, um, basically minus one half g t squared with a one quarter in front, right? Because this one half gets squared, turning into the one quarter. Yeah, yeah. So it looks to be a quarter of what it used, of what the fall used to be. So yeah, one, in fact, one of these uh, answers That's is perfectly reasonable. What's up? So it would be the very top half. It'd yeah, be D. so it would be... Three fourths. Yeah, thing. I agree. That's exactly what it would be. Very, pretty cool. Sweet. Alrighty. Yeah. Was that all the questions you had, or did you have other questions too? 
Uh, that's all I was going to work on for today, but... Yeah, I mean... sounds good. Alrighty, I hope that was uh, informative. It was. Thank you so much, Tudor Bro. Um, are you going to post it on YouTube, or are you going to post it in here? Or... 